Today I want to talk about quantization of angular momentum and in particular I want to talk about the quantization of angular momentum in wave phenomenon. And so if you'll remember from a previous video I showed you this animation of a surface wave of water. So this is a water wave and this is a, an interface wave between water and air. And so the way this works is as the air blows in this direction, it causes the molecules in the water to take on circular motion. And this circular motion is responsible for the uh, creation and propagation of a wave uh, on the water in the direction of the wind. And so the important part here is this circular motion. Okay, I want you to pay attention to this circular motion. I also want you to think about what happens to this circular motion as the wave crashes onto the shoreline. So here is a video I shot of uh, actual waves crashing into the shoreline. So um, as the wind blows, the molecules of the water are set into circular motion and that uh, creates a wave that uh, propagates towards the shore and then when they crash onto the shore I want you to watch carefully to see what happens. Okay so what you can see here is you can actually see the circular motion. You can see the how the uh, waves were created by circular motion. You can see these like streamlines here, which re represents the circular motion of the water. And as the water, um, as the waves crash onto the shore, this circular motion is broken. Uh, you can think of this maybe as the collapse of the wave function. The circular motion gets broken and all of the energy that was stored in that circular motion gets dumped onto the shore. Okay, so I just want to go back to that um, point where you can see the circular motion. Uh, you can, I'm just slowly going, you can see that the circular motion is being broken and um, the wave crashes in the shore and uh, does some work, moves these rocks around the momentum, the angular momentum, the circular momentum from that wave is converted into um, some sort of some form of motion in the uh, whatever is sitting on the shore right there. So if I was standing right there, the wave might the momentum of that wave might push me over. So it seems to me by this analogy and just by pure logic that angular momentum is quantized by the cycle, by this circle of energy. So the complete circle, the complete cycle of energy that's stored in these molecules that are moving in circular motion get dumped onto the uh, the shore. So, you know, partial circle, a partial energy of a partial circle is not getting dumped. The whole cycle is getting dumped to the shore. So I think this is an important point. And um, what I'm going to show is that um, this may, this is not what is done in the mainstream language. In the mainstream language, um, the uh, unit of the radian is used. And I'm going to show you that there might be a flaw in the logic by quantizing angular momentum in radians instead of cycles. So what is a radian? Okay, a radian is an angle in, of a partial angle of a circle such that the arc length of uh, along the circle in this angle is equal to uh, the radius of the circle. So one radian is equal is the angle such that the arc length at the certain radius of a circle is equal to the radius of the circle. So this is true no matter which circle we use. And so if we use this inner circle, then the uh, one radian will give us an arc length uh, at the perimeter of the circle, the circumference of partial circumference of the circle, that equals the radius of the circle. So this is how radians are defined. 
um, radians are, you, you know, angles are usually reported in radians. In theoretical physics, they almost always use radians, but you could also use degrees. So the system that you're brought up in is the degrees. And so degrees is also an arbitrary unit. One degree is an arbitrary unit of measure. And in, in standard uh, measuring systems, uh, you have 360 degrees in one cycle, in one circle. And so why did they choose 360 degrees? Because the, the number 360 is divisible by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, not 7, 8, 9, 10, not 11, and 12. So, the, so 360, the number 360, is divisible by almost all the digits uh, less than 12, except for 7 and 11. Okay, so 360 is very useful. It's very divisible. And uh, this is why they use 360, because you can divide the circle in so many equal, equal ways. So which one is better, uh, radians or degrees? Well, actually, neither is better. If you are reporting your results in radians, you use radians. And if you are reporting your results in degrees, you use degrees. So radians and degrees are no more special than um, t uh, temperature, than Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin. Okay, so uh, radian, one radian is an arbitrary angle in a circle, and one degree is an arbitrary angle in a circle. If you look at your calculator, okay, if you bring up your calculator, unfortunately this is kind of small, but you can see that I can use degrees, radians, or I can use grads. Grads is, um, is another standard where they divide the circle into 400 pieces. So uh, 360 degrees is uh, the same as 2 pi, is the same as 400 grads. So here's the problem as I see it. Angles are by convention considered to be dimensionless quantities. In general, angular velocity has dimension of angle per unit time. The SI unit of angular velocity is radians per second, with the radian being a dimensionless quantity. Thus, the SI units for angular velocity are listed as uh, s to the minus 1 or uh, 1 over s. So, in the context of angular velocity, this unit here, 1 over s, literally translates to radians per second. It's my opinion, and I have said this many times in many videos, it is my opinion that placing the numerical uh, value of 1, or any numerical value for that matter, into the unit section of an equation is a mistake. It's, it's a mistake, because, especially when you actually start using it as the numerical value of 1. For example, the reciprocal of frequency is the time period. Okay, the time, this is the reciprocal of frequency is time period, and by definition of the SI units, this uh, translates to seconds per radian. But because the unit of the radian was replaced with the numerical value of 1 in the unit section, this 1 is seldom, if ever, written. And so then the units of the time period, and now this is a special time period, it's not just any time period, this is the period of one cycle, this is the time it takes for one cycle, and so, um, or for one radian. And so the units of uh, the time period are seconds per radian or seconds per cycle, if you are in the domain of the cycle, okay? Or seconds per degree, if you're in, in the uh, domain of the degree. So I think, 
uh, hopefully you can see uh, what I see and that this is a problem putting the numerical value of one into the unit section and using it as the numerical value of one because you are gonna write the units of the time period. Um, that is, we're talking about wave dynamics here. These are the, the, the seconds per a certain number of angles. Um, you need to write that one in this case as well. And so that is why I came up with modified unit analysis because I replaced this numerical value one with an actual symbol. So in modified unit analysis, if I'm in the domain of the radian, then frequency is, uh, has units radians per second. So I actually write the rad in there. I actually write it in, or sometimes I use a symbol for that. But for this video, I'm writing it in just to be clear so you don't get confused. And so the unit of frequency is, I specifically write radians per second. And in the time period, I specifically write seconds per radian. And for wavelength, I specifically write meters per radian. And for the wave number, which isn't, uh, doesn't show up too often, but when it does, I write radians per meter. Okay, in modified unit analysis, the units of 2 pi is not a unitless number. The units of 2 pi are radians per cycle. And so as you may know from my previous videos that I don't actually work in the domain of the radian, I actually work in the domain of the cycle. So I am trying to do all of physics in the domain of the cycle. So I wanna look at complete cycles like the water wave that I showed at the beginning of this video. Okay, so when I talk about angular momentum, actually I'm going to be talking about uh, circular momentum. So I'm going to actually, when I'm in the domain of the cycle, I'm going to use the term uh, circular momentum. Okay, so in uh, the domain of the cycle, frequency has units cycles per second. The time period, the period for uh, length of time for one wave is seconds per cycle. The wavelength which is the, if in terms of the circle, is the circumference of the circle, has units meters per cycle, and the wave number is the inverse of that, and it is the number of cycles um, per, it has units cycles per meter. Okay, so this is how I am um, trying to fix unit analysis uh, so that we don't make mistakes in interpretation. In, uh, in modified unit analysis, the unit of two pi is radians per cycle. So this is how, this is why we need both the radian and the cycle. Okay, we need them both uh, only so that I can convert from the uh, standard domain of the radian because most of standard physics is done in radians. And so I need this conversion. This is basically a conversion factor. I'll be using two pi to convert from the domain of the radian to the domain of the cycle. So here is another example of the problem as I see it. So here are, uh, these are both incarnations of Planck's energy equation. One is written in terms of standard frequency, cycles per second and the other one is written in terms of angular frequency or radians per second. But when you look at the, the units in the, um, in the standard units, the legacy units, you see that uh, they both frequency and angular frequency have the same unit. Now you just have to know, I guess, uh, that angular frequency, when you're using angular frequency, that this reads radians per second. And when, you, when you're using standard frequency, this reads cycles per second. But you can't know just by looking at the units what, um, which equation this was intended for. And so this is um, an, a, an intuitive problem to me. This is a, an intrinsic problem in interpretation because, uh, and this could also be the cause for some confusion. And so that is why in modified unit analysis, I specifically add um, a symbol uh, to represent either the radian 
or the cycle. And so when you look at these units, I clearly know that I'm using E equals HF. And I, when I look at these units, I know that I'm in the domain of the radian and therefore I'm using uh, this equation E equals H bar, reduce Planck's constant times angular frequency. And so uh, modified unit analysis makes things more clear. And, but again, I am more, I'm more interested in converting from the domain of the radian to the domain of the cycle. I want to do, see if I can do all of physics in the domain of the cycle, because, and especially if we want to understand quantization, because as you saw in the water wave analogy, that um, you need that the whole that, that the energy delivered to the shore of the detector to the shore of the uh, wave where the wave crashes is going to be quantized by the whole cycle the whole circle and 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 the radian is only a partial uh, uh, arc length along the full circumference of the circle and so I believe that when you're on, in the domain of radians, that you cannot be talking about quantization. The, to me, it doesn't seem logical for angular momentum or energy or anything to be quantized by the arbitrary uh, unit of the rad, of the radian. So when you think about it, all the units in the standard, in the international standard, are arbitrary units. The second is arbitrary, the meter is arbitrary, the kilogram is arbitrary, the coulomb is arbitrary. If the radians were in the standard, they would also be arbitrary. The only unit that isn't in the standard but is in modified unit analysis, the only unit that isn't arbitrary is the cycle. And this is the one, this is cycle was left out of the international language. The only unit that isn't arbitrary is the cycle. Because the cycle is once around the circle. It's the circumference of the circle. It is the um, wavelength. It is the length of a wave if you're talking about wave dynamics. But we're talking about angular momentum here and we're talking about the circle. And I believe that um, angular momentum, which I'm now going to refer to as circular momentum, is quantized by the cycle. Oh, and there's one more thing I want to point out um, on this page before I move on, is uh, as you can see when you do modified unit analysis, the units of Planck's constant are um, the units of standard units of angular momentum or action or whatever you want to call that per cycle. Okay, so this is the energy of one period of light, if you want to look at it that way. And in this equation, H bar has units of um, angular momentum per radian. So clearly you can see that when you use H bar, you're also on a per radian uh, basis. You're in the domain of the, of the um, radian. And so I want to stick with the domain of the cycle because one complete cycle, it makes logical sense that quantization is on a per cycle basis and not on a per the arbitrary radian basis. And so when we're talking, if we're talking about quantization, I think it's important to stick with the domain of the cycle. So in order to convert from the domain of the radian to the domain of the cycle, in order to convert from angular momentum to circular momentum, we need to uh, convert from radians, the domain of the radian, to the domain of the cycle. And so, uh, and this is done by utilizing this unit here, 2 pi, which has the units radians per cycle. So clearly there are 2 pi radians in one cycle. So if you take 2 and multiply it by pi, you get the beautiful 6.28. So um, there are 6.28 uh, of these along this circle. And so this is our conversion factor to help us convert from the domain of the radian to the domain of the cycle. So here is the equation or one of the equations of angular momentum. 
So here we have angular momentum is equal to the mass times the velocity, mass times velocity, which is momentum, times the radius. And so the distance that, the further away that the, um, say the particle is from the uh, origin, the uh, higher the angular momentum it is going to have. And this is based on tangential, um, the velocity here is the tangential velocity. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to first deal with this velocity term and uh, convert, because normally this is done in, the, in radians, and I want to convert to the cycle. And so here is the equation for tangential velocity. Tangential velocity is generally written as the radius times the angular frequency, but the angular frequency is in radians per second. And so uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is convert um, angular frequency to standard frequency. So 2 pi times cyclic frequency converts to angular frequency. So I'm going to convert back to cyclic frequency. And then I'm going to group this 2 pi with the radius term because we know 2 pi times the radius is the circumference of the circle. And so I can rewrite the tangential velocity and get the right answer, get the same answer by using the circumference of the circle and the standard frequency. So this is how we convert the velocity term from this equation to the domain of the cycle from the domain of the radius. So here is the tangential velocity written in terms of the circumference of the circle. So tangential velocity is the circumference of a circle times the standard frequency, which is in cycles per second. And so the units of velocity, of course, are meters per second. The units of uh, the um, circumference of a circle is meters per cycle, obviously. So this is the number of meters um, of the arc length, the measurement of this arc length of one complete cycle uh, and not the arbitrary arc length of um, the, that is uh, calculated when you are in the domain of the radian. So when you're in the domain of the cycle, you use the whole cycle. So you have to plug in the circumference of the circle uh, to get the right answer. And of course, the units of frequency in modified unit analysis are cycles per second. So I, I explicitly invented a symbol to correspond to cycles, and this is meters per cycle, and this is cycles per second. So now I'm going to rewrite this equation, the equation for angular momentum, in terms of circular, circular momentum in the domain of cycle. So angular momentum is written for the domain of the radian, okay, and I want to rewrite it in the domain of the one complete cycle. So here is what I've come up with, the uh, circular momentum, not angular momentum, circular momentum is equal to the mass times the tangential velocity, which we converted to the cyclic domain. Of course, it's going to be the same. But then instead of multiplying by the radius, I multiply by the circumference. Okay, so I'm going to get a different value for circular momentum than I will for angular momentum. And so I'm just going to show you the uh, how the units map out. So mass, of course, has units kilogram. Uh, the circumference of a circle has units meters per cycle. The um, frequency in the domain of cycle is cycles per second. So this F term here has units cycles per second. This second, um, uh, circumference term has units meters per cycle. And so these ones cancel and you end up with the units of momentum. So this is the momentum of one cycle. So it's the momentum of one turn around the wheel at this distance. And so of course, as the radius gets bigger, also their circumference gets bigger. So as the circumference gets bigger, the circular momentum also gets bigger. 
So uh, this doesn't change in meaning necessarily, but it does change. This does produce a different value than this value because I am using now using the circumference of the circle. And clearly you can see that more energy will be stored in the circumference of a circle than will be stored in the arbitrary uh, arc length of uh, the radius um, based on one radian. So the point I'm trying to make here is the arbitrariness of the radian as opposed to the non-arbitrary um, nature of the cycle. And that I think we will, and it makes sense that angular momentum would be quantized by the cycle and not by the radian. Okay, so this is um, a conclusion I've come to. And if I'm going to switch to the domain of the cycle from the domain of the radius, then I am going to have to keep in mind that the momentum that I'm calculating is the circular momentum and not the angular momentum in terms of the radian. So getting back to Planck's energy equation, given the logic that I just showed you, it is uh, much more clear to see that Planck's constant, or the, to see the difference between Planck's constant and reduced Planck's constant. Reduced Planck's constant, yeah, does have the um, angular momentum uh, per radian. So this is the angular momentum per radian. And, um, and uh, normal Planck's constant, non-reduced Planck's constant, has units of angular momentum per cycle. So modified unit analysis um, is able to help, was able to help me distinguish the difference between H and H bar. And uh, I'm able to actually use H. I don't actually need H bar. My goal is to only ever use H and only ever use cycle and never invoke the radian um, and never invoke H bar. And I believe that all of physics can be done uh, in this manner um, on a per cycle basis instead of a per radian basis. And we will get a better understanding of things like the quantization. It makes sense that you know angular momentum and energy is quantized by the one complete cycle because when the, as I showed you before, when the wave crashes onto the shore, the whole cycle gets dumped onto the shore. And so that energy, the whole energy of the whole angular momentum of the water molecules um, orbiting in a circle, that uh, whole circle of energy um, gets, um, you know, emitted from the wave and crashes onto the shore. And so I'm going to leave it at that. I think that's enough information for one session. I do want to do one little thing, maybe a little teaser here. Um, I want to remind you about my uh, own particle schematic. This is my this is my schematic of a part of a wave part of the wave particle duality. So in this schematic, you can see that this is representing a spinning vortex. Obviously, I refer to this as a vortex and a vortex pair. The um, circumference of the circle is, if this is a particle, the circumference of the circle would be the Compton wavelength of the particle. And the radius of the particle is uh, exactly equal to the uh, what I'm calling charge separation to the separation between these two dots. And I would, and so in terms of interpreting these dots, I was actually struggling with coming up with a meaning for these dots. But then I had the help of um, the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project and, and Bob Greener and their great research that they're doing into low energy nuclear reactors. And uh, he actually gave, sent me this picture where he superimposed the yin yang onto these um, vortex and a vortex pairs that they're finding in their experiments. And so this is sort of further evidence that my model is, is uh, very close. The schematic, not a model, it's a schematic, um, represents some sort of physical reality. And so in, in their experiments, what they're finding is they're finding these vortices that are um, sort of a hill on one side 
and a valley on the other side. And so now I can interpret the um, this schematic a little more accurately and I can tell you that um, that this part of the vortex here represents a, a valley. So it's going from high. So if white is high and black is low, it's going from high down to a low into the valley. And this would represent a hill. So it goes from low to high. And this would be the peak of a hill. And this would be the um, bottom uh, of the valley. And so this was, uh, I was very excited when I saw this work here. And also the work of uh, John Mackin, where he also shows an animation of the exact same uh, vortex, anti-vortex pair with a hill on one side and a valley on the other. You could imagine that, you know, this is kind of like a sine wave that is spinning in a vortex structure. And so um, when you look at these together, you can see, so this would represent the valley and this would represent the hill. So here is a video showing John Mackin's vortex that, that matches nicely with my schematic. And so I want you to see this. This is another way of representing the distortion of the universal field produced by the rotating wave in the electron's core. So I can now identify my schematic as a rotating vortex pair, a rotating wave, that um, is nicely depicted in the work, both the work of, of John Mackin and, um, and Bob Greener and the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. And so, um, so I think I'm onto some really cool things here. I'm connecting a lot of pieces, um, uh, bringing people together, or at least uh, looking at their puzzle pieces and seeing how they fit into, um, into my puzzle. And so uh, that's all I'm going to say for now. Um, I have been very busy with my NFT project. I want to make a video about that in, in a little bit. And I want to offer my YouTube subscribers um, maybe a special whitelist, um, put you on the whitelist for my collection when I uh, set it up to mint. And so if you think you might be interested in that, let me know. Uh, I don't want to bother you guys with my NFT project if you're not interested in in it but uh, if you are then i would really like to know so i hope you guys have a are having a great weekend and um i'll be back